Hello and welcome back to the entrance of thy words. We've been looking at the Mosaic Covenant for the last couple of weeks. We're going to continue uh, with that today. Uh, much of your Bible deals with the Mosaic Covenant, so we'll probably take longer on this one than we will uh, the rest of them. We're going to pick it up here in Exodus chapter 19. And remember, uh, quickly here, let's, let's recap. Uh, the Mosaic Covenant is a uh, conditional covenant. It's conditioned on um, God telling uh, the children of Israel, if you do this, I'll do this. If you do this, I'll do this. Uh, so there's conditions attached to the promise that God is making to Israel. Again, uh, like the Abrahamic covenant, it involves a piece of land. So he's going to get into some of the details here about their land and how he will bless it. Uh, he's obviously blessing them too, but a lot of this has to do with the land that he has given to them if you do this, 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 and this, I'll not only bless your land, but I'll leave you in that land. <clears throat> if you don't, um, and you turn against me, then I'll start to curse the ground and curse the land, uh, and then I'll kick you out eventually, which he does, and we've seen that. Now, in our day and age, he's brought them back in and made a nation out of them and given them that piece of property back, but uh, they don't have peace in that place yet, and eventually they will have that. <clears throat> now, Look at uh, Exodus 19, we'll read verses 6 through 8. Uh, and you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Uh, these are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. And Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before their faces all these words which the Lord commanded him. There's always an emphasis here on the word of God, the words of God. Verse 8, and all the people answered together and said, here's what they say to the Lord and to Moses. All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. So we looked at this last time briefly. Um, there's an extra comment in uh, Deuteronomy in chapter 5 about this. Where the Lord says, after they say to him, all that you've told us to do, we're going to do that. And the Lord says, oh, that there were a heart in this people. That they could accomplish this and that I could bless them and bless their children. But he knows who they are. He knows how they are. Um, and they're going to uh, turn against him and turn to other gods and, and be self-willed and selfish and, and stiff-necked and all those things. And so they're going to end up getting in trouble. But it, it, this is in Exodus 19, and we're reading verses 6 through 8, but eventually in Exodus 20, what he's going to give them is, in this Mosaic Covenant, he's going to give them what we know as the Ten Commandments. Now, <clears throat> um, there's another religious group that will alter these Ten Commandments. They'll leave out verses 4 and 5. It's the Second Commandment. And for obvious reasons, because it's incriminating on their religion, uh, thou shalt make, he says, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above. And so they'll take the Tenth Commandment and make two out of that so that they can get ten, and they'll leave the second one out because it's... Uh, rough on their religion because they use idols uh, and images for their aid to worship, they say. Uh, now, these Ten Commandments, they're, they're, it's, it's good for us. We need to learn from the Ten Commandments. We need to pay attention to them. But these aren't given to us as New Testament Christians initially. They're given to the children of Israel. And the Sabbath shows up in here. Uh, we, we don't adhere to the Sabbath. Okay, the Sabbath is the seventh day. It's the seventh day of rest. Uh, it's it's a, a picture for these Jews that there's going to be about 6,000 years and then God is going to come and, and his son is going to be set up as the king of the Jews and there's going to be that seventh day or that seventh millennium and they're going to rule and reign. He's going to rule and reign. Uh, and the, the Jews, Israel, would be uh, on top of the nations and they'll rule for with him for a thousand years. We'll get to rule with him uh, as the as his bride for a thousand years. So uh, this is a Jewish type thing here. Okay, now you come over to Exodus 34, and what we're going to deal with primarily this week is the fact that this Mosaic covenant involves um, also warfare. God charges 
uh, his people, Israel, to go and conquer other nations. In the Old Testament, it's it's not it's different. It's a, it's a different setup than what we have in the New Testament. It's a literal, physical, visible kingdom where he's charging them to go and take out vengeance on these other nations, punish them, subdue, kill their people, kill their livestock in some cases, uh, where he commands Saul to do that as Israel's first king. And it's a, it's a, a thing where armies are involved. Now in the New Testament, we know that we're dealing with the kingdom of God. It's a spiritual thing. It's, uh, it's not meat and drink, not physical, visible things. It's in you. It's spiritual. It's Romans 14, you get that information among a multitude of other places. But here in Exodus chapter 34, you pick it up in verse uh, 10, and it says this, And he said, Behold, I make a covenant. And here's, here's what we're talking about. We're talking about the Mosaic Covenant. Before all thy people I will do marvels such as have not been done in all the earth, nor in any nation, and all the people among which thou art shall see the work of the Lord. For it is a terrible thing that I will do with thee. Observe thou that which I command thee this day. Behold, I drive out before thee the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Perizzite, and the Hivite, and the Jebusite. Notice, historically, this is a, this is a historical document Okay, that we have in front of us. There are no Palestinians in the land. It's never been the land of Palestine. It was the land of Canaan. So there's no such thing as a Palestinian. Take heed to thyself, watch, lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land whither thou goest, lest it be for a snare in the midst of thee. But ye shall destroy their altars, break their images, and cut down their groves. For thou shalt worship no other God, for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God. Now, first of all, let me say this. He says in verse 12 to the children of Israel, you make sure that you don't make a covenant with these people that are in the land. Well, the people that are in the land are the uh, Arabs, Muslims, uh, all, those, all those people in that area. There's not supposed to be Oslo, Camp David, Y, Roadmap to Peace, all that. God says don't make a covenant with those people. Those people are not out to help you. They're out to hurt you. They're like uh, the people that Ezra and Nehemiah dealt with in their days. Uh, Sanballat and Tobiah and all those people. Those people came and said, let us build with you. We're on your side. We want to help you, you know. And... Ezra and Nehemiah said, no, you don't. Your God is not our God, and you don't want to help us. You want to stop the work. You want to hinder the work. And you want to infiltrate the camp and then and then set each other, uh, all the children of Israel at odds with each other. And so God tells them, do not do that. But in verse 13, he said, but you shall destroy their altars. So again, in the Old Testament, it's armies. Go in, defeat, conquer, get rid of because he knows that if they leave them in the land, then they'll be a detriment to the children of Israel. Well, what does that mean for places like the Dome of the Rock? It's, it should not be there. It should be destroyed, torn down. That piece of property does not belong to anyone else other than the children of Israel. And then he says this. <clears throat> he says in verse 14, Thou shalt worship no other god, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. That's one of his names. So you get that in the, in Song of Solomon chapter 8 <clears throat> and verse 6. God is a balanced God. Yes, he is a God of love, but he's also a God of vengeance. And part of true love is jealousy. Now, you know that. I don't have to explain that to you. Um, if, if Guys, if your wife said to you, listen... Um, I, I love you, I want to be with you, but I want to I want to be with this fella on Monday night and this other fella on Thursday night, but the other five nights of the week I'll spend with you. Well, that, that's not going to work because jealousy, true, pure, right jealousy is a part of love. And you can't, you're not going to do that. 
uh, unless you don't really love her, and then you're going to let her spend the other two or three nights a week with somebody else. Now, the wisest man that ever lived said here in Song of Solomon chapter 8, verse 6, Set me as a seal upon thine heart, as a seal upon thine arm, for and he defines love. For love is strong as death, jealousy is cruel as the grave. The coals thereof are coals of fire, which hath a most vehement flame. So he ends up moving into uh, hell and talking about a flame and fire. God is a God of love, but he's a balanced God, and he's a jealous God. And he wants the children of Israel's undivided attention. He wants their devotedness to him, their hearts set toward him. That's what he wants from you, saved person, even in the New Testament. He wants you to uh, set your affection, Colossians chapter 3, on him, right? Now, uh, this is a bloody book. It's, it's hack them up warfare in the Old Testament. That's coming back at the second advent when the blood flows to the horse bridles in Revelation chapter 19, okay? So um, you, you know that, not only from what happens in the Old Testament, but you also know that from uh, what you find in places like Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 9. Nineteen, For when Moses, we're talking about the Mosaic Covenant, for when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people. Blood. Blood on the book. Blood on the people. So it used to, I've got a couple of Bibles in my library that have, um, instead of gold, they have on the... Uh, edges of the pages on the on the outer edges of the pages they have red because that signifies that it's a bloody book uh, sacrifice in the old testament sacrifice at calvary blood at the second advent when the lord comes back um, all his enemies are are defeated there and there's uh, blood that flows to the horse bridles so he's a god also not just of love but of vengeance and wrath so you say, well, how does that happen? How is that possible that a God, would, loving God, would execute judgment? He executes judgment after being a long-suffering God. He uses nations to punish Israel, and he uses Israel as a nation to punish other nations in the Old Testament. That's how that works. Physical, visible, literal things there. In Exodus chapter 6, I think it's verse 25, 26, something like that, when he calls Israel out of Egypt he says he calls them out with their armies it's military occupation it's a military combat type setup in the Old Testament um, the, the problem is when these New Testament religions try to usurp that authority or try to replace that and say that oh we can do that in the New Testament too we don't do that You've never heard us here at Bible Baptist Church say that we think that God has called us to uh, take up uh, weapons and collect ammunition and start to spread the kingdom with bloodshed. That's not a New Testament setup. The problem with what I just said is you know that the Pope thinks that that's what he's supposed to do because of the Crusades, because of what you read in the Council of Trent, because of what you read in Vatican II, because of what you read in church history, you understand very well that that's what they think. They think they can spread the kingdom by violence in the New Testament, and that's not true. You have to rightly divide. All the imams and most Muslims will tell you that they think that Muhammad was the prophet like unto Moses that was mentioned in Deuteronomy 18. Well, what's wrong with that? Well, the problem with that is Moses did carry out vengeance, some of the children of Israel moving on with Saul and David and all the different kings. They carried out God's commands and they destroyed other nations. We can't do that in the New Testament, okay? Um, that's, this, that's not what we're supposed to be doing. And, and you know that from reading the Word of God. You're, you're sure of that, okay? Now, we had that in the, uh, in the Civil War here. Uh, we had a, a 
Northern Union that felt like they were spreading the kingdom by squashing out all the slave-owning Southerners. In fact, Julia Ward Howe wrote a hymn about that. It's called the Battle, Battle, Warfare, Hymn, Church of the Republic State. So she's there putting church and state together and they're spreading the kingdom by squashing out the grapes where the grapes of wrath are stored and his truth is marching on. If we can just beat these old wicked southerners, then the Lord will bring in the kingdom. Uh, he didn't, and she was wrong, and that was, that was a mess. Now, what you do from here is, what we'll do this next time, you get into Leviticus chapter 26, where the Lord outlines, if you do this, then I'll do this for you, and if you do this, I'll do this for you. And in the Old Testament, with the children of Israel, it's a physical, literal, visible, spread the kingdom by warfare type thing. That's coming in again, and if you're saved, you're going to be you're in the Lord's army, and you're going to be on the right side. But right now, we're not called to do that because the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Okay, hope you've enjoyed that, and have a great day.